Yep, I know your type. You're the type that isn't satisfied with the results that you receive in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom with their HDR blending. You're the type who needs to go into Photoshop and make luminosity masks because they're more predictable and can give you better results for blending exposures. I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. But I've got something to show you today that I think you're really going to enjoy. If you're the type of person who loves using luminosity masks to blend two different layers to create an HDR style image, you are going to love what I'm about to show you here in Photoshop. So let's dive in. I've got two images here in Adobe Camera Raw, and I like the sky for this image, okay? And I like the foreground for this image. Now, there is the possibility of me just possibly pressing auto here and getting somewhat decent results to try and get the shadows brought out, but this image is just a little bit too dark. So I'm going to go ahead and reset that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to process these two images in two different ways. I'm going to process this image for the sky. I'm going to process this image for the foreground, and then we're going to open them up in Photoshop and we're going to blend them, but we're not going to do it with luminosity masks. We're going to do it with blend if. Okay, so the first things first, let me process this image for this sky. Okay, so for this guy, I might need a little bit more of that yellow up in there. I might go ahead and increase the exposure just a little bit to brighten up those clouds. Maybe reduce the highlights to get rid of some of the uh, blowouts that I might have there. Maybe increase some of the shadows. And maybe go ahead here and reduce some of those whites as well. Okay, so and now that I look at it, it's going to be a little, little too dark. So let me go ahead and put the exposure up too. Now we'll go to this one, and for this image, we're going to be uh, working on specifically the foreground because we like how bright this is, but it might be too bright, so we'll work through that. But the thing is here, we just don't have the data available to us. If we go ahead and bring our exposure slider down, we don't have any data up here for our sky. So it's really important to get the sky from this image to go into the foreground uh, of this image or the sky of this image so that the sky and the foreground look pretty good together. So I'm going to drop the uh, exposure here a little bit for the foreground. I'm going to go ahead and brighten up those highlights a little bit, maybe even make my shadows a little bit more deep and give this a little bit more contrast for that foreground. And while we're at it, I'm going to warm this up as well and just give it a little bit more warmth there. It looked like both of these exposures need a little bit of warmth. Now, I'm not trying to go too far here in Adobe Camera Raw. My job here is really just to get these to a baseline. Okay, now I want to open these as smart objects because I'm going to show you a way that you can work with blend if with smart objects for your raw images. So I'm going to select both of these. I'll press and hold shift or control and select both of these and then press and hold shift and we'll say open objects. We want to make sure that both are selected because if both aren't selected, it's only going to open one of them. So open objects. That's going to open these guys up in Photoshop as smart objects to give us a lot more use for them in the future. So let's go ahead. And now that we've got these set up, I'm going to go ahead and grab the top image and I'm just going to press V for the move tool, press and hold shift and drag it and drop it onto the back image. Now I'm going to close that because I don't need that that way anymore. And I can go ahead and make this fit on screen and pop this open here. Okay. So now we have one layer on top of the other layer. There is a way that you can have Photoshop automatically detect the edges and combine them together with auto align. I'm not a huge fan of that. I actually prefer using something like the difference blend mode and to make sure that these things are aligned. Now, what you'll see when you have the difference blend mode set is if they aren't aligned, you're going to see a little line around here that's something different than the than the actual object. So again, V for the move tool, I'm just going to press my arrow keys and make sure that these are aligned and I'm going to align them as best as possible. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but we want to do it to the best that we can. Okay, so it looks like everything else along the image is nicely aligned. Might be right about here. It's aligned on that side, and then this side, it's fine if it's not perfect. We'll just go up just a little bit more, okay? As long as it's pretty close, that's all I'm really worried about for this because there's other methods that we can use to make that blend look a little bit better, and we'll do that too. So I'll go to press normal on this. So now we've got one layer on top of the other layer. Traditionally, what would happen here is you might make a selection for this background using something like a luminosity mask. So I'll show you how that looks so you can see what I'm talking about when it comes to luminosity masking. And then I'm going to show you how I do this with blend diff. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to select. I'm going to go to color range and I'm going to go to my highlights. OK, now that's going to be basically everything back here. And we can dial in exactly what this is going to look like with the range adjustment here and what the fuzziness looks like. That's how much of a transition we have. And typically, this would be something that I'd be looking for. I want some type of transition between the sky and the mountains. And if anything's here in the foreground, I could always get rid of that later. So I'm not too concerned with that. Now, once we make the selection for that, we would come up to this image here and we put that mask on there. OK, now what we have is ideally 
will be the best of both worlds. We've got the foreground from this image, and we've got the sky from this image. Now, obviously, like I said, when we look at this mask here, we do have some stuff in the foreground. So we would press B for our brush tool, and we could go ahead and paint this in just like this. And that would go ahead and make sure that that area is not in there so that we could get a better blend. And then what I would probably do here too is I'd, I'd probably make my brush a little bit bigger. And then I would just brush along here like this. And then we have the two of those blended together. Now I'll get into the reasons why we would want these separated like this in Photoshop uh, in, in a minute after I talk about the blend if stuff. Right now I'm going to take a little pause, a little detour here. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to duplicate this work by pressing this button here in my history. So we can see that in the first document that's going to be up here, we are going to have the luminosity masking. And in this second document here, we're going to have blend if. All right. So now I've got these separated we got this one here for our luminosity masking and we've got this one here that's gonna be set up for blend if so i'm going to take this mask i'm just going to delete it and this is really just for me to show you the comparison between the two methods so essentially what happens here if i want this sky to only go into the highlight areas of this image and i want to do this with blend if and not with masking what i need to do is i have to ask myself what is it that i need to make sure is protected from the underlying image and that would be basically the shadow areas because I want this to go into those highlight areas. So I'm going to double click on this. And after I double click on that, it's going to open up the layer styles dialog. Here in the layer styles dialog, we see blend if right here. Now what I'm going to do in order for you to see this so you can see it better is I'm going to turn a color overlay on. And that color overlay I'm going to set to magenta. It's just a color that I like to use because it's typically not something that we see in a lot of our work. And I'm going to go back to the blending options. So I did say in order for this sky to go into the sky below, we want it to go into the highlight area. So we don't want to protect the highlights because this is basically saying that right now, if we turn this color overlay off, we're taking the darkest dark areas and putting it on top of our darkest dark areas. And that's not what we want. OK, so let's turn this color overlay back on to get that blend a little bit better. I'll move this over so we can see the whole image. And now I'm going to move over from this side and that will protect the underlying layers, shadowy areas from getting hit by this sky above. So now if I press Alt or Option, I can split this and I can feather it over to make a nice smooth transition between the areas of highlight and shadow. And I'll go ahead and press OK. That looks pretty good. I can turn the color overlay off so you can see this. Again, it might not be perfect when it comes to this edge here. And we might need to do a little bit of masking, but that's OK. We'll go ahead and press OK. All right. So now you'll see the main difference here. We do not have a mask next to this. We do have a mask on this one. This is a pixel layer mask, which means that that pixel layer mask is basically saying, hey, this is a container. And the container that I've chosen here is very rigid in that everything from this image has to fit within this container that goes on this and nothing can change or shift. Now with blend if we don't see the container there. The container is is adapted within the blend if settings, which is constantly calculating what's happening below. There's a couple benefits for that. The first benefit is that your file size will actually be smaller because it doesn't have a pixel mask on this layer. The second reason I like to do this is because if anything fluctuates or changes underneath this layer, let's say this image gets a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. As we move the curve, the way that this layer above is going to interact with it, it's going to manipulate itself based on the data that it sees coming underneath it. So as things get darker or lighter underneath it, depending on the values that we're using down there for the blend if it will modify itself. You'll see here that if we were to actually turn on that color overlay again to see where this is affecting with that curve underneath there, it's it's a, a dynamic mask. OK, and this the way this dynamic mask works is that as anything changes or fluctuates on this image below, whether it gets brighter or darker, that mask is going to change. OK, now I would never do this to my image. It just shows you that it will always change based on the data that's underneath it. And it's not stuck with a container like this where that mask is basically always the same. You'll notice that in this mask, we don't have well, the adaptation that would happen here if we were to take this curve. Control C and put it on top of this layer here. Control V. This mask above does not change at all. It doesn't change at all. OK, it's it's just a constant mask. It's a constant container. The benefit here is that the with blend if anything that happens underneath this layer as it gets lighter or darker, depending on the blend if settings that we're using here, it's going to fluctuate because of that. OK, so I'll turn that color overlay off. So let me go ahead and show you this uh, using my new blend if panel. OK, so in case you're curious, how would you do this with the blend if panel? Blake, well, let's check this out. I'm going to go ahead and right click this and say clear layer styles in this blend if panel. You'll see here 
we have a, this set to the underlying layers, okay? So now as I move this over from this side, you can start to see that we're protecting the underlying layers, darkest dark areas, and we're seeing it right here happen inside of Photoshop, and we don't even have to go into the blend if settings for this at all. Okay. Now, if I wanted to see what this looks like, I'll just go ahead and press the overlay button and I can see exactly where the mask is there. And you'll see that the color overlay is set here. This is actually a toggle. So you can toggle this on and off as well. Okay. Now we've got this set up. We've got both of our masks set up. We can work on this independently. I would still, in this case, I know that I said that you don't necessarily have to use a mask, but because this isn't blending very well right here, I might use a mask for that, or I might make this transition out a little bit more like that before I start using my mask. I'll put a mask on here and then brush right here just like this to get that blend to be good now whether you're using luminosity mask or blend if you still may need to use some type of layer mask here in order to get them to blend better so just know that we're in photoshop we can use a combination of anything to help us out so why did i open these up as smart objects well here is one of the reasons why i open these up as smart objects because at any time if i needed to uh, adjust maybe this foreground image now that i look at that sky there i'm like hmm, maybe this needs to be a little bit darker i could double click on this and that'll open me back up into adobe camera raw now i'm not going to be able to see this new sky on top of it because it's opening up the camera raw data for this very specific image but I could go back into the basic settings and say, you know, make that a little bit darker for me, okay? And then adjust my shadows here a little bit, maybe even my highlights here a little bit, and, and then we'll call that good. We, we have this a little bit darker, okay? And we're good to go. Now you could do something like that with a curves adjustment layer, but this is showing you why we would use smart objects for this so we can get those two objects to blend pretty well. And I guess maybe the next question that comes is, Blake, why would I make these two separate things? Can't I just go and make an HDR image in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw and then use the new sky masking to do very similar things? And the answer is yes, you very well could. But the reason why I like doing this in Photoshop is it gives us ways to explore with maybe even things like color grading for this image, where we could apply a very specific color just to the sky. For this instance, I could go to a solid color fill, and maybe I'll make this a deeper, more rich blue like this. And then I'll press Alt or Option, so that this only affects the sky. And I could change this blend mode to something like soft light, drop the opacity a little bit, and maybe I wanna change that sky now that I look at it. I can start manipulating this sky here using the tools that are in Photoshop. Now, I know that you can still do this in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw using the masking tools. I get it. But here's the deal. You don't have access to blend modes. You don't have access to blend if. You don't have access to uh, things like opacity. So for me, I actually prefer to do this type of stuff in Photoshop. And I could independently color grade for the foreground. So I could add a new co solid color fill here. And this solid color fill, let me make that a little bit more on the orange side. And then when I press OK, I'm going to use the soft light blend mode, drop the opacity here a little bit. And then from here, I could change this color to any color that I want to. And you see that I've got color theory working for me here because now this warmth is in the foreground and the blue is in the background and I've got them separated. Again, you could do this in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom, but what's the difference? After I just told you this, we have opacity, we have blend modes. Blend modes have an interesting way of calculating how they are going to apply to our image. And it gives us a lot more leverage over the decisions that we're making for the images that we're working on. I like Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom for the new features that have been added there, especially with the new masking features, but they still pale in comparison to the masking features in Photoshop or even Blend If in Photoshop. So we could even take this Blend If stuff a little bit further here as well, especially because we have the panel here. So maybe I'll make a gradient on here. And with this gradient, I'll change this to a radial gradient that goes right from the middle. Let's change the color on this to something a little bit brighter. This is, I use this as like a, what I call a flashlight or a spotlight. And I'll double click on this color and I'll change this to a warmer color here like this. Press OK. Press OK. And then it looks like the outside of this color is still black. So I'll double click on this and maybe even make that a little bit brighter on the outside of that. Press OK. Press OK. Now, I like to set this to something called the linear light blend mode. And when this is set to linear light, it's basically like dodging and burning. I'll come down to the fill and drop this to about something like 15 to 20 percent. And then when I double click on this, this becomes like a dodging and burning where I can put this anywhere I want on my image. And it dodges and burns almost at the exact same time while adding that certain light of color to it as I drag this around and I'll press OK. Now, the problem with this, though, is that I don't like that this brightness is affecting all my dark areas. It's almost as if I just want this in maybe the highlight areas or the midtones. Well, that's something I would use Blend If for. 
Again, I do like luminosity masking, but blend if is just a little bit more functional for me. So watch this. If I change this and say no darks, I don't want this to affect any of the darkest areas underneath. When we double click inside here, we can look at the blend if that's happening here because the blend if that's happening right here is the same thing as the blend if that's happening right here, which is the same thing as me pushing this button right here. And now, the real benefit of this is that if I double click on this and I move this around, no matter where a dark area is, it is always going to be protecting those underlying dark areas. And that is something a luminosity mask just cannot do. Now, I did say that I like luminosity masks, but this is something that a luminosity mask just cannot do. Because as I double click this and move this around to make this little spotlight flashlight that I have here, it is always and constantly going to be protecting any of the darkest dark areas that happen to be underneath this spot. And as things would possibly get darker underneath this spot, it's also going to be protecting itself from there. So watch what happens when we put this overlay on. This overlay is going to be covering the entire layer. So it's not going to show us our little spot beam that we have here. But watch what happens as we go underneath this and we modify this curve and make this image darker. As we make it darker, look, it's affecting less and less and less and less and less air in the image because what's happening underneath is getting darker. So if you're one of those people who, as you're working, is also working on things that are happening underneath and doesn't want to have to worry about making sure a luminosity mask is in the right place or changing that luminosity mask as things get lighter or darker underneath that is where blend if just shines it is really powerful what blend if can do when we use it like this for exposure blending so not only did we did we do an exposure blend with this by adding blend if to the sky above we also used blend if to make this spotlight here so that we can really get the best of both worlds for both our sky and our foreground. And you can continue to color grade like this all day long. And no matter what, as things change underneath, Blend If is constantly going to be changing dynamically based on the data that is fed underneath it. And that's what makes Blend If so powerful. If you're interested in my new course, The Unrivaled Blend If, I'm gonna teach you 10 different ways that I use Blend If in my workflow and give you this awesome panel to go with it. Go ahead and click right up here and that will take you to the page where you can learn more about this panel. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. I like to take difficult things in Photoshop, make them seemingly simple so that you can use them in your workflow today.